before we start, I wanted to mention, because this doesn't happen to me very often, but in a Guardian interview this week, a very famous footballer, needless to say, I'd never heard of him, but a very famous footballer called Felipe Luiz, who uh, is Brazilian, plays for Brazil, but also played for Chelsea, talked about the best thing he'd ever seen in his life. And it wasn't anything to do with football. It turned out to be Interstellar Live at the Royal Albert Hall, which oh, I, I produced. That. And uh, I thought that was amazing that even six years on, something that I put together and conceived is still being talked about by people, of all people, footballers. And it turned out, it turned out he, so he was there and he was there with Thierry Henry, who's a footballer I had heard of. And he got to meet Michael Caine because Michael was there as one of the guests. And uh, it really was one of the great moments in his life. And it just feels really rather lovely to, to, to discover that people are still talking about something you put, put together. So there you go. That was the big news for me this week and a, and a real surprise as well to, to yeah. read that. So that was nice. Isn't that nice? Really nice. <laughs> anyway, here we are. Welcome to the Classical Top Five. With me, as always, are Richard Bratby and Charlotte Gardner. Now, today we're talking about earworms, relatively modern term, I think, for those tunes and pieces that get stuck in your head and are impossible to shift, whether you like them or not. Um, the great arranger and composer, John Altman, who's worked on over 4,000 TV commercials in his long career, he told me that advertising agencies would say to him that a tune doesn't have to be likable, it has to be memorable. And in fact, the more annoying, the better. And uh, classical composers, of course, have been writing music that gets into our heads for as long as there's been music. But which are the ones that have placed themselves in our brains and not being dislodged for ages. Now, I have to admit, you two, I, I rather enjoyed this one. Uh, <laughs> how did you find it? Because we all have them, don't we? Whether, uh, as I said before, as whether we like them or not, some tunes just get lodged in and you cannot get rid of them, can you, Charlotte? No, absolutely. I'm there, and, and it's what I really loved about this one, actually, it wasn't just so much the picking the tunes. It was the just thinking about the science behind it. Yeah, because it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I was I'm afraid at school science was my Achilles heel. But since school, I've actually got rather into there's a wonderful American um, musical um, expert on music and psychology called Diana Deutsch. And her writings on music of the brain and the brain are really accessible and really fascinating. So I was actually dipping into her latest mm. book yesterday. And one point that she made that had never occurred to me, and I suddenly thought, oh my gosh, you're right. She pointed out that with earworms, they, they go a certain a point in the song and then they loop back. And mm. you cannot predict when that loop is gonna happen, but you never get to the end of the song. And so I was thinking when compiling these pieces <laughs> to begin with, I was thinking, oh, it's funny, you know, I've got some symphonic earworms and in a sense, they're the most annoying because often you'll get the theme and then suddenly be dispersed into development or into a second theme. But actually with an earworm, earworms don't go on for that long anyway. So mm. it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. but there were so many other interesting snippets of information that I'll probably be peppering yeah. this conversation with. But uh, I think that that uh, quote from John Altman is absolutely right. It doesn't actually have to be a good melody at all. Mm -hmm. And in, in fact, it may not even be a mel melody, it might just be a little fragment. It just it, it's something that trips it off in your brain. And of course, it, every, one person's earworm is another person's sort of take it or leave it, isn't it? And it has to be a familiarity thing and a recent thing as well. I mean, generally, my morning earworm is whatever my son was playing in his piano practice before yes. we walked to school. It yeah. could be a scale. In fact, that's the most annoying one when we're walking up the road and all I can hear is D major. Yes. Yes. And, and actually, if, we'd, if it had been um, earworms of children's television programmes, I'd have been right in there and had at least 20 of them because all of my earworms right now are Thomas the Tank Engine, Fireman Sam and Hey Dougie. Because uh, we hear them a thousand times every day, and uh, yeah. you can you barely uh, um, avoid them being earworms. Richard, how did you get on with this one? 
it's interesting what Charlotte just said about the idea of them looping round. I too found this. It's a, a melodies that kind of don't have an end. They form a loop in your head. You can't mm. kind of stop humming them. And th that was certainly one quality I noticed. I mean, one of the ones I'm going to mention is really, um, really strong example of that. Um, basically just a few notes. And I mean, I mean yeah, if, if a melody, I, I contend with a melody, is that memorable? This is a good melody. I think that is what, you know, um, it might be annoying, but it's certainly a good melody. It's doing its function, <laughs> you know. And the other thing I noticed, um, when I, as I sort of put my list together, I mean, it's interesting, one would one would lodge there. The only way to get it out is to dislodge it with another one. That's the other thing. So you're in this permanent <laughs> loop of, you know, yes. you find one, you couldn't let it go. And then you find, so the only way is to find another to squeeze it out. And essentially oh. the last one standing was the last one I listened to before this podcast started. That's the one that's going around at the moment. That's though, a very interesting, it's a very interesting technique yeah. that actually, because I was thinking about that too. How do you get rid of them? And actually the way I get rid of them, in a way is to listen to them again. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I'm a total musical obsessive in this area. I, earworms are absolutely what I like in a way, because if I latch hold of a piece of music that I like, I absolutely stay with it obsessively until I'm done with it. So I listen to it again and again and again until I know every little bit of it, every single note, every little inflection of the performances, every little bit of detail about that piece. And then, and that can last for ages. And then, and then when I'm done, I'm done. And often I don't come back to that piece. I, I've been looking at this and thinking about this. I often don't come to that, back to that piece for years later uh, because I've, I've managed to just excise it from my brain and that's it. It won't come back and I'm on to the next thing. And, and, and actually also it's a bit of a, um, a it, it, this happens a lot with me when I'm putting together film projects. So when I'm doing my live film stuff, because with a film, you know, I've, I've done a lot of them now, but, you know, Interstellar, North by Northwest, The Great Escape, Independence Day, Brassed Off the Piano. These are all ones I've spent months and months and months on, sometimes nearly a year on, just exclusively on that one score. And I end up watching the film because of the way in which it's synchronized and the way I have to produce that sometimes over a hundred times 150 times sometimes it really depends and you get to know that music so well the only way you can possibly deal with it at the end is to try and get rid of it completely and as maybe as Richard says move on to the next one but it becomes so obsessive in my head I go to bed with it I wake up with it it's there in my dreams it's just mm. totally there and it's and that is the for me is the ultimate earworm is all of those notes just rattling around in my head obsessively for the amount of time it takes to do those projects and actually it can be quite unpleasant in the it can end. it's interesting what you say about analysis it's going back to diana deutsch one of the correspondents who wrote to her was saying that the way he got rid of a song that was going around in his head was to write it out repeatedly with the words in different orders <laughs> and she the way that she finds that she gets something out of her head is that she simply asks herself why it's in her head she analyzes the psychology of why it's even there mm. not even the, the musical structure and she says that tends to do the trick for her. <laughs> I, bet it does. I, I think I think we all have these sort of inner soundtracks, don't we? I said people who spend a lot of time around music. I, I don't know many people who don't spend a lot of time around music, so <laughs> maybe everyone does this. But the, I, I, you know, the the Proustian connection, the, the the soundtrack to your life, the, the certain thing. I will suddenly yeah. find a tune is going around my head, and I can't think of how it got there. I haven't been mm. reading about it. I haven't been actively thinking about it. And I'll realise that you know earlier that day I just had you know. Um, tomato soup or something for lunch and at, at some point in my life I'd been eating this you know I think it was when I was working on the CBSO youth orchestra I've been having that stuff every day at a local restaurant a local cafe for lunch and I got that piece I think it was um, Richard Strauss's Zarathustra or whatever I, I I hear that piece I taste the tomato soup and suddenly years later I taste the same thing and there's the music or, or, or the mind sometimes follows these little trains of connection it just pulls them out without you even realizing why and I, I sometimes have to really do a bit of detective work to work out why I'm suddenly thinking of these pieces is. Yeah. But um, I mean, the other quality I was going to say about earworms, a curious thing, is maybe just me, um, but as I sort of wrote my list down, I found I'd, I'd say about sort of two thirds of the pieces that I, I really struggle to get out of my head once they're in there uh, are in a similar sort of tempo, which is a fairly steady sort of um, walking pace, sort of jog trot kind of. I'd say I, I, I haven't analysed it, but I guess probably something around relating to the pulse, the pace of the pulse. Mm. Um, so, so natural, it just locks into you. So it locks into the way your brain is working, your whole body is working. And it's they're, they're all fairly steady, moderato, walking pace kind of tunes. Uh, occasionally, some of, the very, some of the very fast ones, you know, which also 
But again, I wouldn't be surprised if that was sort of double double the other speed. I mean, I don't have that many slow earworms or insanely fast earworms. It's always that kind of um, 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 <laughs> all kind of that speed, um, yeah. roughly. Well, I say about two thirds of them are, and it's. I think that's a curious, a curious. Um, the, the 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 one that came to my mind immediately when we decided to do this project is a is a slow one and actually it's a loopy one i mean when you say about a, a loop um it literally is a loop um of varying lengths depending on which version you listen to but it's gavin Bryars' is jesus blood never failed me yet and the whole idea of that piece is is that it is just one tune that was in this case sung by a, a homeless man solo that was then essentially set to music harmonized by Gavin Bryars. Um, and it just goes round and round and round. So in a way, the idea of the piece is that it becomes an earworm. And I mean, the first version of it was 25 minutes because it fitted onto a, an LP side. And uh, he did a cassette version because that could be 60 minutes. And then <laughs> with CD, it became 75 minutes. And actually that was the version I think that, mo that everybody knows it became very uh, quite a successful CD uh, at that point in the early 90s when quite a lot of CDs of new music were, were, were doing quite well and uh, I mean not even necessarily new music but things like Goretzky's Third was also very big at that point there was all that going on um, and Gavin did this version with Tom Waits the great singer who has this extraordinary gravelly voice that's very distinctive to put over the top uh, to sing with this homeless man who by this point had died um and it's very haunting i mean and i think it's the sort of piece that could drive some people absolutely insane because after about 20 times of hearing it they've had enough but for me always it's been a, almost like a spiritual experience where you just the music just enters you and you just let it just do what it needs to do and you find so many different ways the brilliance of it the way he he creates the the harmonies underneath with strings and, and various other instruments going on there the way it's beautifully unfolds i think as a piece and also rather movingly in the end the the homeless man's voice drifts away and you're left just with tom waits and I think that's a rather lovely way of sort of suggesting that the man, the homeless man's spirit kind of lives on in through this extraordinary voice of Tom Waits. I find it, even though it is just the same thing repeated over and over and over again. And by the way, they did a 12 hour version at the Tate Modern in 2019. Uh, I'd love to have gone to, but unfortunately the twins spoiled that. Um, <laughs> but it would, I would have loved to have just laid on the floor as many people did and just let it drift over you amazing experience but i think that in a way it's the ultimate earworm because it's, it's designed to get right there inside you because it's the same tune over and over again how can it be anything else you know you don't leave a performance of it not singing it going having it going around and around in your brain so that was uh that was one the one i thought of thought of immediately are there any that presented themselves to you, Charlotte, immediately? <laughs> well, do you, the, there are, but do you know what? Richard, having just been talking about an earworm coming to him at night, I'm going to talk first about the one that came to me when I was lying awake at three o'clock in the morning thinking about this podcast. <laughs> um, and it came literally out of nowhere. So it clearly is very, very deep, deeply wired in me. Um, it's Mozart's um, aria, Un Moto di Gioia, A Joyful Emotion. This was a substitute aria that he created for the 1789 revival of The Marriage of Figaro, um, when Nancy Storace was replaced by Francesca Gabrielli, or Adriana Ferrese del Bene, who was apparently da, um, da Ponte's mistress. And um, it's not usually sung in opera these days. Um, it, it's not usually sung in the opera. Um, it was, it replaced um, Veniti in, in you know, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Veniti in Giociatevi, um, the come here, sit down, when Susanna is dressing up Carabino and saying, you know, let me put your makeup on. And, and that's a really funny aria in itself, because it's kind of halfway between recitative and an aria, there's no real tune as such. Um, and instead, what replaced it for this new singer was the ultimate earworm. It's da dun da 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 dun da 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 dun da 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 da. That's the rhythm over and over. It's the three time. It's what Richard was saying about it, kind of being a pulse speed. Um, there's a lilt, there's bounce. It's the same rhythms over and over again. 
Um, there's not really a contrasting middle section. In fact, there isn't. So it just loops twice and then it stops. Um, and the other interesting thing about it is that it's, um, there is something also about incongruity that makes something lodge in your head as well. And this particular aria, um, Gabrielli was apparently, um, she had very, very high register and also a striking low register. And so you have these incredible lines that one moment they're right up top and the next moment they're down in the chest voice. So there's one jump that goes from top E down to um, the D above middle C. So it's a, it's a leap of a ninth. And there's another way you've got a run that goes all the way from top G down to low B. And it does, it's weird singing it because you're using parts of the voice that as a soprano, you're not normally singing. And actually, if you weren't her, um, it can be a bit of a dance quib because you, sometimes the climaxes happen at the bottom B level. And as a soprano, you actually can't carry that off. But I think for all of these reasons, it just, it's been in my head. It was, it was a singing exam. It was an ABRSM singing exam in the nineties. So anybody doing singing exams in the nineties, you might know this piece too. And it's just, <laughs> I've never got it out of my head. I can, I know all the words. I haven't sung this thing for 30 years now, probably. And there it is. Hmm. Well, I, I'm slightly worried that you're waking up at three o'clock in the morning um, <laughs> thinking about the podcast. Richard, uh, do you wake up uh, at three o'clock in the morning thinking about the podcast? <laughs> I'm usually still up watching watching old films and things. Ah, okay. This is how I actually get my thinking done. You know, this is why I sort of start having ideas for things that will actually make sense in the morning. But yeah, but, yeah, but there's <laughs> nothing worse than I mean, the insomnia feeling, staying awake with the music going round and round. Oh, and absolutely. And, and, and I, I mean, there are a couple of pieces. We just say a tune doesn't necessarily have to be good it, it can just be memorable and i'm thinking of there's a couple of pieces of, of melodies really that sibelius wrote and, and which became the found you know that he used them as foundations of much much greater much larger works you know building huge structures out of these things but the things themselves are so simple and yet so unbelievably infectious and and there's one i mean maybe just me that feels this way the opening cello bass motif of the third symphony um, I, I just, it's one of those, it's one of those tunes you sort of hear it, you think, can you write a tune? Is that even a tune? How can you begin a symphony like that? That's just, it's that's, is that a tune? Um, but it's, once, once that's going in my head, I just can't turn the damn thing off. Um, and of course, you know, Sibelius builds in something terrific. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I think Sibelius came to mind because um, when you first mentioned earworms as a, you know, as a topic, um, it's not a term I like very much. I always picture that scene in The Wrath of Khan um, when um, those horrible alien creatures squirm into the ears and do oh, yes. people's mind control. And, um, and and that in turn sort of took me to um, a short story I read years ago by Arthur C. Clarke. I can't remember its name. But it's a kind of a slightly whimsical sort of Tales of the Unexpected kind of story about a scientist who is obsessed with a finale of Sibelius' second symphony, the big tune there, da, 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 that one. Um, and he decided that on the basis of that to analyse what made a melody memorable. Um, and he went off and did this and he announced to his colleagues that he perfected it. He'd come up with a computer program that generated the most memorable melody imaginable. And then no one saw him for six weeks. So he was, then he was found dead in his laboratory, having starved to death, having been so gripped by the tune the computer had come up with that was so memorable. <laughs> if you heard it, you would never be able to do anything else, think about anything else ever again. It just paralyzed you. Um, and um, what that melody was, of course, none of them ever listened to it because to do so would be fateful. Yes. <laughs> and, and for me, I mean, the closest thing I can think of to that, to that melody, a melody it should, it, well, it, it's, it's just even a melody. The finale, the great horn motif in the finale of Sibelius is fifth. Yes. It sort of comes to 12, 12 notes. It's just a string of 12 chords in a particular relationship to each other. Brilliantly scored, that horns, that sort of ringing. It's all, it's all there, the texture. But once that starts going around in my head, that will go on for bloody ever and and it's um <laughs> yeah it doesn't stop i mean it's built in that's part of the way surveyors have structured it and i mean it's so simple and so utterly memorable and so recognizable i think i think i think the beach boys quoted it wasn't it in a was it strawberry switchblade you used it in the 80s in a pop song it's been in lots and lots of pop music context it's instantly recognizable and it's instantly memorable and you don't mm. have to know classical music you know people who don't know classical music here it's just you know that they're, they're sucked in as well those that Four swinging his hammer, it's sometimes called or swan him, or these various terms that have been used to describe it. You know the one I mean, of course. Mm. And, um, um, and, and that for me is that, you know, to me, that's a, that's a piece of a, a sequence that could just go round and round and round forever and could probably slowly drive you mad. If, like some alias, you can't break out of it or, um, I, or know where you're going with it. I, I thought maybe uh, one good way of finding out my earworms was asking the person I live with, mother of my children, 
because of course there are earworms that you have that you might not even realize are your earworms until someone tells you to shut up and stop whistling it or singing it. And uh, she, when I asked her, the first thing she said was Scheherazade. And mm. I, I don't think I'd even realized that it was uh, an earworm. And now, now she mentions it, absolutely it was. I remember we, we did it in a concert. And I'm always fascinated, by the way, in, if you do a concert with lots of pieces in, what are you left with at the end? What do you go home whistling? What, do, what is it that's in your head? And this, this always becomes very pertinent when I do film music concerts, where every single piece we do is an incredibly famous melody. So which is the one that you're, you end up with? Which is the one that a lot of people will go home whistling? Um, and of, of course, everybody has a different one, but it can often be very, very surprising that. And again, it goes back, Charlotte, to what you're talking about with the, with the study of why the brain actually latches hold of something. When, when, you're, when you hear 15 to 16 really famous melodies that you know, and and there's only one bit that you take home in your brain that is fascinating and i'd love to know really why that why that is what is it about that particular little bit but with scheherazade it's not even the big big tunes really apparently the bit that i kept kept going around and around and around and around with and kept whistling and everything is just a violin bit which goes i mean Let's not sing too much, but it, that's all I was doing. So I was going around the house doing that a lot, apparently, and not really realizing it, which is a whole other level of earworm, isn't it? Because <laughs> it's just, it's got in there and you haven't even perhaps even realized it much to the irritation of people around you. I was going to say the, you talking about how it's, it's strange what actually becomes the earworm. That's something that I particularly found with um, a couple of my choices. Um, but one of them, I don't know, the, equal levels um the idea that it's for me two of my choices they are more about the mood that's created if you like um it, it's something very hard to put your finger on um one of them is a baroque choice now it's, this was a great one for a baroque person this week because uh, after american orchestral works which was not exactly baroque heavy suddenly it's bonanza time here <laughs> um the Baroque era, they were massively into earworms. Um, there was a new publishing industry that was aimed at amateurs. Lots of popular songs were being transcribed, folk songs put into collections for the first time of arrangements, um, variations being composed on them. Um, a huge aspect of Baroque performance practice was about how to ornament tastefully. Mm. And a lot of the time, what the tutors and treatises, how they taught their readers to do this is they would take a popular tune that was that was effectively an earworm. So what, you know this tune, this is now how we're gonna teach you to ornament on it. And so it's all over the Baroque era. And then of course, when you've got this um, highly competitive um, theater opera world, you know, where Vivaldi and Handel needed to make sure that they had a hit, one of the ways that they might make sure that the audience is happy early on is that they take a famous tune from something that went down well in an earlier production mm. and they recast it in this new one and so everybody's sat there thinking oh my gosh I know this one hey I really like this production and the one that really sticks in my head um over and over again and it's almost a good it's kind of good kind of bad when it appears on yet another cd it's a ground by gottfried finger it's for recorder it's from his third book of 400 airs for recorder it's in d minor and it published in amsterdam in 1704 and what i love about this piece is that you have this obviously this um repeated ostinato bass it's just four notes going down over and over again and um, it's late night light music. It's got um, this wonderful D minor darkness to it. It's hypnotic, it sets a mood. It's a wonderful program opener um, if you want to create that sort of deep dark atmosphere in a concert. And it's gradually the recorder, the embellishments, um, the, invari the variations get more and more florid. It gets more and more emotional um, as it goes and sort of more, um, I want to say transcendental, it's not quite that, but if perhaps you'll know what I mean if you say it. Um, it's absolutely wonderful stuff. And when it's been on, it just stays in my head again and again and again. And it's not, as I say, it's not so much because of the melody, because the melody changes with every repetition, but you've got this ground going on. And as a result, it's the mood and the darkness that stays, which is actually quite powerful. 
it's late night music um it's hypnotic it's it's dark and it leaves it's not just the fact that you have this ground in your head afterwards it leaves an emotion um a feeling that you kind of can't shake uh, it's a wonderful program opener if you want to set set a mood for an entire evening yeah Sound, sounds kind of on a similar maybe setting of Pachelbel's Canon as a very, very famous example of something yeah. that ch cellists the world over absolutely hate because it's they just play that one thing all the way through. I mean, that that's another ear. That's another era. Earworm, oh, totally. It? <laughs> it's funny that the, the finger one is actually better in terms of just sticking in your head and, and having more of an emotional world around it for some reason. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Richard, what else, um, is, what else got in, gets into your head? What I was saying earlier about that sort of steady pace, that sort of chugging sort of rhythm. I mean, I don't know so many of my my, my pieces that came into my mind ha have that quality about them. But the, all of them, in every case, coupled to two things. A, um, a genuinely good melody, a really terrific, cracking tune, um, and just a really perfect instrumental or, or accompanimental harmonic setting. Just, you know, it, it, the, the framework is just right. So these things are just, the, the conditions are perfectly right for these things to just sink into your your head and um, one was a tune i mean i didn't know what it was when i was growing up for many years until the day i heard it in its proper classical context and realized this is a tune my father had been whistling and humming um since i was as long as i could remember and it's the popular song from facade by walton ah, yes. for me that is that is the perfect earworm especially in its purely orchestral the sort of orchestral suite version he did so absolutely delicious scoring the kind of mm easy that kind of wry understated preparation the sort of laying down like the vamp that um um Mark Shaman was talking about the other week when we talked about musicals they're sort of laying the introduction you sort of prepare the ground and then this tune which just it's just you know it's all it feels like it's always been there you've mm. always known of this tune the first time you hear it maybe because I always had um, yeah. without knowing what it was but it just feels so easy and so natural and I, I've got a whole list of pieces that are, are sort of like this you know this Greek second Norwegian dance lovely melody on the oboe um, there's any number of things by Gilbert and Sullivan Three Little Maze is the one that stuck to my mind it's sort of beautifully prepared beautifully I was going to mention just, Three Little Maze and, and that yeah. rhythm that little rhythm that just locks in you can't you know yeah. it's, it has that jauntiness which is yeah. just absolutely infectious I mean Elgar's like Capricious, um, and lots yeah. of Elgar's smaller pieces have that quality. Um, you know, Ponchielli's Dance of the Hours, so um, Johann Strauss's Anne and Polka, they all have that sort of quality of a, a melody perfectly matched to its accompaniment, to its framing, to its setting. But ultimately, it's that catchiness of that melody, that sort of cheeky, I don't know, that way it just tags onto your memory and sticks around there. Um, and, and that's, uh, Vorjak's Humoresque is another one. They're, they all have that similar quality, that sort of pace about them, that sort of easygoing um, pulse type pace, which I think just sort of seems to lock onto mm. your subconscious and, and stay there, ready to pop out uh, when, when something prompts it. I think um, off the back of what Charlotte was talking about, I think it's a good time for me to bring in my, my current earworm, the one I'm currently obsessed with and listening to about a thousand times a day because it's by Handel and, and, you know, he knew how to write a hit song, didn't mm. he? Um, the problem I've always had with Handel's hit songs in operas, of course, is everything else in the opera, where you have to sit through tedious, <laughs> endless passages and da capo arias where you think this is never going to end. Uh, and it does seem quite interesting to me, and I'm no specialist in Baroque opera by any, any means, that quite a number of of the really well-known tunes that are utterly gorgeous by Handel are very, come very, very late on in his operas. Um, and you do have to sit through a couple of hours before you get to it. Um, uh, if, if, if that's how you view it <laughs> as, oh, we're, we're gonna be getting to the hit record very, very soon. Now I'm, I, I've said it before, but I'm very much a highlights package person when it comes to Baroque, particularly to Baroque opera. I went to a Baroque opera once, but we left it after the first act because it really, really wasn't happening for me. But um, goodness, when he hits you with it, it is sublime and extraordinary. And what do you do? Um, I, there are just a couple of handle moments that really would be my desert island discs which i think for a lot of people who know my taste would be quite surprising but especially as i get older i think they speak to me much much more more clearly and the one so the one i'm listening to at the moment a lot and is absolutely lodged in in my brain um is the famous aria from ronaldo which is lascia chopianga uh, mm -hmm. let me weep over my cruel fate and let me sigh for liberty 
it's one of those gorgeous pieces that if you don't know the words, perhaps you might be forgiven for thinking is something about beauty and happiness. But actually, as is so often the case, <laughs> it's not really that at all. I mean, this is a plea from a woman to her captor about her liberty. Um, so it really is much more um, impassioned and from the heart, really. Um, I heard it because uh, we just had classic ephemeral in the background and most of that stuff just sort of was sailing by. And then all of a sudden this recording came on of this piece. And I, I know, I know it, I, I, I know the, the, it's not, wasn't the first time I'd heard it, but actually it was a really wonderful recording uh, with um, Ellen Manahan Thomas singing with the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, and Harry Christophers. And I just thought it was the most beautiful little version. I like her, voice because it doesn't draw attention to itself in the sense that it's not all about her it's about the music it's not a diva performance so that was something that attracted me but then there's this just extraordinary beauty in that writing and doing more research into it Charlotte I wanted to ask you about this because you know about this stuff but in the manuscript for it apparently it's really just the melody he wrote the melody and he wrote one single line bass line he didn't even write anything at all about the, the, the continuo part, really, and no harmony in there. And it was to others that did that. I wonder whether he sat there and wrote that and thought, this is going to get them. They're going to love this one. <laughs> I've given and them two or... hours of this stuff, but this, one, this is the thing that's going to absolutely get them. Yeah, he was just the ultimate tunesmith, Handel. He did absolutely glorious stuff. And and he was somebody, he's one of the people that would take, think, okay, that song really hit the right buttons in my previous opera, so I'm going to put it in this one too. Mm. And of course, it's funny what you say about the operas. Actually, the, my husband came with me to a Handel opera once. I'm afraid he fell asleep. Um, yes. I had to nudge him after a while. Um, but with the oratorios, Handel, it's almost as if he thought, do you know what? I'm just going to give them hit after hit after hit. And so you've got something like the Messiah where they just keep coming. Mm. And the, so the oratorios, I think, for most people are a far more enjoyable thing. But it's funny, the, the two Baroque giants, Handel and Bach, um, Bach produced far fewer earworms. It's either long spun out things. I mean, you, you wouldn't, the, the beginning of the St. Matthew Passion, it is so famous, but you can't have it. It doesn't stick in your head afterwards and except in a sort of feeling, emotional sense. There's a Barmadick, though. I mean, yeah, there is. a Barmadick can be a bit of an earworm because it's such a beautiful little tune. I just well, think, it out, for me, it just outstays yeah. its welcome. It just goes I, on. I, I mean, the, the bark earworms, surely, are the, are the, are the, are the air. Um, yeah, the air on the G-string. And, yeah. and, and, um, and what's it called? I think it was a scene from Antique Roadshow, which shows how old I am. Um, the first Brandenburg. Um, oh, third, yes. third Brandenburg. Yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah. Yeah, um, and yeah. and the and the fifth as well, and also of course there's the the E major violin concerto. The da, 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 ba, da, dum, ba, da, dum, ba, dum, ba, da, dum, ba, da, 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 da. So that one as well. But I mean, funnily, actually, Bach is one of mine, um, purely actually because of the sheer surprise factor. It's from the the orchestral suite number two in B minor was one of my GCSE pieces. Ah, yeah, yeah. And and I'm afraid I'm really glad that I already knew things like the E major violin concerto and the Brandenburgs by that point, because it didn't massively sell bark to me. <laughs> it's it's OK. Um, it's very tasteful. Um, but the thing is, you've got this very kind of tasteful OK. You know, it's perfect for GCSE students. Here's a Bore, here's a Rondo. Um, and not terribly interesting, to be honest. That's a terrible thing for a Baroque critic to say. But then you get to the bedinery at the end. And oh my gosh, suddenly he throws in this pop trash, basically. Um, suddenly it's up tempo. And, and I wondered at the time, th this was my favorite piece coming back to people like familiarity. And this was my favorite piece when I was 16, just because it was so familiar and, and I, could, I could hum it easily. Um, and I absolutely loved it. And I wondered whether it was simply because I didn't like the rest of the suite very much, or at least the suite didn't grab me. But of course, then mobile phones came in and the bedinery became a ringtone. And you realise that actually it's not just that. There is something about it, the repetitive rhythm and the jauntiness that does just appeal to everybody. But yeah, that was my bark earworm. And actually, that's an annoying one for me. I don't mind having no air on the G string or the E major concerto stuck in my head, whereas the bedinery will have me screaming for mercy. I always wonder with with I, I was just saying about Handel and, and Bach and this sort of 
ability to occasionally knock out the park with a really cracking hit tune um and hours and hours of stuff that is far far perhaps less immediately obvious and memorable and it's i'm just wondering i know I, there was what i was thinking was how the, the hornpipe from Handel's water music um mm. which i think it used to be on adverts when we were kids didn't it? and it's yeah. that's a cracking tune and, and it's these, these things i say you mentioned the oratorios against the operas um I, you, you get the impression that when he was when he's writing for a big crowd for a big public audience for something that's going to be heard by a lot of people um in, in a public context he could absolutely pull those tunes out, out, out of the box and when he's writing an opera which he knew was for a sort of fashionable crowd who are going largely because opera was fashionable who would be walking in and out shagging each other in the boxes calling for um you know calling for pies and bottles of port to be brought up while you know uh, that it was perhaps only you know what one decent melody in a, in, a, in three and a half hours of drama would probably carry it do you think i don't know maybe that's cynical <laughs> but I, I think it is important to bring in the ones that we don't like that sit in our our heads. I mean, Charlotte would say she doesn't particularly want that bark melody in her head, but it, it gets there. Um, I mean, I have to say, Richard, I, I'm so sorry, but actually, Three Little Maids is 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 the one. It, I, out of all of GNS, I mean, I, and and I've already said that I don't really like GNS at all. But that, and I don't particularly like Three Little Maids. But oh, I get oh, I'm stuck in there as soon as I hear it. And I remember I watched the the, the wonderful um, Mike Lee film about about um, a tr uh, about uh, um, Gilbert and Sullivan. And there's there's the scene where they they do that little scene of three little maids and they're rehearsing, and after that I'm left with that tiny little fragment of music for days afterwards, and it drives me insane. I wanted to bring in actually a couple of people um, who commented on on this subject on uh, on Facebook when I put it out there. Gillian Moore, for example, um, of the South Bank Centre, uh, and was formerly. Uh, Chief Executive of the L London Sinfonietta, she said um, that the Rat Song and Crusoe Song from H.K. Gruber's Frankenstein was one of her earworms. She said on a Sinfonietta project in Berlin in the late 80s, there was literally a fine for anybody who started humming or whistling it absentmindedly. <laughs> and uh, she said it's, it's horrific. You know? measures. Uh, you, do, you know that she must love that piece. I'm sure she does, but it is a great, great piece, but it... it when everybody who's doing it starts to be whistling it all the time, that's when it starts to get right inside your blood veins and you go, ah, I've gotta, it's got to go, it's got to go. I mean, I, I think actually to be one of the kings of the earworm nowadays is Carl Jenkins, isn't he? Now, there may be a number of reasons that's the case. One of them is he is, whatever you think of him, uh, he does come up with some very memorable tunes. You may then also say, but he doesn't always necessarily know what to do with them afterwards, and so just sort of repeats them, uh, not quite in the kind of Gavin Bryars Jesus Blood way, but um, it's certainly true that he knows exactly what to do for you to leave the venue whistling that that tune. Um, and uh, certainly, one another one of mine was was the Benedictus from the Armed Man. I mean, I've I've heard it before many times. It's been on the radio a lot and all the rest of it. I actually do quite like it as a little piece. I think it's a wonderful little moment. Um, I don't really like the the Armed Man as a whole piece, but that's one of those lovely little fragment moments. And it's a it's a cello solo with chorus and orchestra. Guy Johnston played it on the first recording really beautifully, and it is a lovely little melody. But once you hear it. That, that it's it's it that's it it's all over for at least a week for me because it just sits there and there, actually there's another one in, in the arm man as well but it it just a little bit of it but ah oh, he he does manage to do it and in fact a few people mentioned on facebook as well this palladio piece that was written mm. uh for the uh, for de beers for a de beers commercial and then turned into a much longer piece he expanded it out um that's another one it just gets in that you know it's the strings one da 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 dum da 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 dum that one and uh you know again i mean his whole and, and addy amos i suppose is probably the ultimate one as well which everyone was whistling addy amos at one point because there it was in 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 uh, commercials and of course that's that makes the people who have the commercials very very happy doesn't it if everybody's out there whistling the tunes from their commercials what more could you want uh perfect and i think i think carl's brilliant at that he gets um a lot of uh criticism i think in classical music circles whatever they might be but i think he he's a genius at that kind of very um uh, the 30 second if you like for those commercials where he comes up with something very distinct that you can remember instantly that you've heard it which is yeah it's quite a skill 
It's funny, Carl Jenkins, he sits at completely the opposite end of the scale to a really interesting scientific um, experiment that I was reading about yesterday. This was when um, a woman called Susan Margolis took pieces by Berio and Elliot Carter and they, who had specifically not repeated anything. I think there were probably 12 tone pieces. And she took one, took two of these pieces and played them straight. And then she took the pieces again and she doctored them and lifted without any musical integrity whatsoever, chunks from the beginning and put them at separate points throughout the piece. So effectively you had repetition suddenly in that piece, even though it made no musical sense whatsoever. And hmm. then she played the, the two, the undoctored and the doctored versions to first of all, a not set of a room of non-musical experts and then to a room of professional musicians and get this both groups prefer the doctored versions without <laughs> any musical integrity because the human brain is just wired to like familiarity and to be able to latch on to something and yeah. that's exactly what Carl Jenkins is doing but yeah uh, but you remind me that there is a 12 tone piece that is absolutely an earworm for me and that is the main title music to the film the 70s film the taking of Pelham 123 music by David Shire which is based on a 12 tone row you can hear it but he makes it a really memorable melody. It's genius. And that was a, that's definitely an earworm for me when, when I hear it. In fact, when the uh, twins were in hospital, first of all, there was a, a machine in the ward that did beeps that were exactly the same as the opening bit of, of his tune for uh, his ostinato figure for the uh, for, for the taking of Pelham one two three, and that got into my brain for a week while I was sitting there <laughs> cuddling these tiny little things, thinking of the t taking Pelham one two three thing going beep 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 do 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 do. It, it's those and and of course in a hospital situation like that, they are just repeat th those beeps are just going on and on and on, aren't they? And, and actually to the point where you ignore them eventually they just become part of the oral landscape which maybe is another way of uh, of thinking of an of an earworm is that you get so it's it's there so much that you almost can forget it eventually because it's just there i don't know god there's so many there's so many to go through any <laughs> uh, any more any more from you richard um what you just said about the um the bleeping of the machine in the hospital i can think that there was a bin lorry that used to reverse outside our office but, um <laughs> sounded exactly like um, i said right. some reason it, it was bleeping i don't know i think it was voices from voices of spring by johan strauss it's always reminded me of a phrase in that and it always triggered that and i also had a, a colleague who had a mobile phone ringtone which it was not a piece of music it's just a, a series of little 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 chimes like a little rock spiel and i i just but here here here's 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 my show off um obscure earworm um i i, I always think oh god it's it, he's about to listen to nielsen six symphony <laughs> this is the opening of nielsen six we're hearing there i think every time <laughs> as these little chimes came on but i, I don't know I, I was thinking i i mean you can if we can start talking about broadway and, and, and film music and so on i mean film music i've got to mention um Malcolm Arnold's um, theme um, from Whistle Down the Wind. For me, that is mm. an absolutely indelible melody. That's, and again, it has that quality of circularity. Once you get going with it, it kind of loops round and round and round and um, you can't really stop it. Um, and I, I, my, I've had my wife complaining about me whistling that for about three days solid, apparently, around the house, that particular theme. Um, but I, I was trying to think more of sort of classical works which, which yeah. should suddenly throw you an absolute lollipop humdinger of a tune, which which just latches in there. The, the one I always remember is my youth orchestra, we're playing uh, César Franck's Symphony in D minor, which is just a great gothic, grand romantic piece. Um, it doesn't really prepare you for when you get to the finale, and we launch into the finale, which is a terrific pounding rhythm at the beginning of the piece. And then suddenly this melody, which is just so almost jazzy. Um, is, that um, the one that, is that the one that goes da 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 dee da 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 Yeah, exactly that one. Yes, exactly that yeah, one. Um, that's a great that's one. Okay. It's, it's, quoted, it's actually quoted by... Um, um, Rogers and Hart in their musical on their to on your on your toes as a scene with a music lesson and um, he sort of picks out that melody um, and, he, and he's, he's singing who was this written by and to his <laughs> class and they by by Caesar Frank and he's pronounced it Caesar and um, <laughs> I, I always think of that now and then the not only do you have that terrific tune which just swings along with this incredible verve again it has that circularity it goes round and round once you start humming that tune you don't I don't know where to stop it or how to break off it. But Cesar Frank does. I and mean, then he's got another utterly cracking little motif, um, which he, he brings it on the cornets and it's da 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 da
and then oh I, I don't know he's all it's just it's just I I love that ability he had to sort of give us this grand exploration of sort of romanticism as it's most gothic it's most moody it's most Roman Catholic um <laughs> it's most post Wagnerian and then just at the end just go straight clear into this glorious open-hearted swinging easy clear melodies like the, I mean, the, the violin sonata is another example that that canon at the end of the violin sonata i know that really bugs some people i think i think charlotte once said didn't you it really drove you up the wall or something Probably. Like that. <laughs> yes I, I mean classical pieces that have these sort of things embedded in them it's always it always feels like you've you've stumbled on a real jewel you've been handed a real treat by the composer um another one is Sansol second second piano concerto, the scherzo in the middle, um, which is a brilliantly written, witty, br brilliant piece of orchestral writing, opening with a little quiet mm. timpani solo, and then it just swings off into this great swinging, uh, zonking, uh, great um, earworm of a tune, which again goes round and round in your head. Da -da, da -da, da -da. And uh, you know, it, it has that pace about it, that sort of slight, that 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 swinging pulse type rhythm, um, which all. You know, it seems to be part of what makes something infectious. But again, I can't get that up my head. I have to say, if something is really witty and cheerful, I actually don't mind. When I'm doing a gramophone collection, often that will lodge in the head. And recently mm. I did Beethoven's Violin Concerto. Nobody in the family minded that everybody was singing the final rondo. I and mean, literally, we'll break into it at the supper table regularly. Even now, my we were, we were discussing classical top five last night and my daughter started singing the rondo at the table because it's just, <laughs> it's become one of those family earworms. And the same, the, the Haydn C major cello concerto um the 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 pizzicato movement of ravel's string quartet the da, 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 da. Mm. it's just it's glorious it's clever it's interesting the the textures are great i don't mind having that in my head and i was thinking what i really really don't like in my head is when a piece is really really sad i'm mean, going back to film music there's i'm mean, schindler's list i actually don't really want that in my head too much it's just <laughs> too much but the other one that's been really it's been my constant earworm over the last couple of months is a piece that that I wasn't even on my radar about probably six months ago. And then suddenly twice in quick succession, I've been commissioned program notes on it. Um, it's Borjak's Romance in F minor for violin. Mm. And I just don't like this piece. It's, it's <laughs> a strange little piece. Um, 12 minutes standalone for violin and orchestra, although there's a piano accompaniment too. And it was composed in 1887. Vorjak was 36. He was yet to achieve him. He was just on the cusp of being famous. He'd been discovered by Brahms, taken on by Brahms's publisher Simrock, and the Hungarian dances would come out the following year. But right now, Slavonic dances rather. But at this moment, Vorjak was really, he was having an absolutely appalling time. Earlier that year, he'd lost all three of his children in quick succession to a combination of um, some sort of early... Um, newborn thing there was phosphorus poisoning there was um something else all three tiny children lost um he was struggling on a tiny church organist salary um he was having to receive a grant from the viennese government to to help him um and so it was really dark times and then he was commissioned to write this sort of little piece for the orchestra that he had been playing in in prague before he got married and he clearly, he must have been at rock bottom, didn't know what, he, he probably had no inspiration whatsoever. He probably couldn't get his head around an awful lot. So he reached back to um, the slow movement of a string quartet in F minor that remained unpublished in his lifetime, that he'd actually written the year of his marriage when he was still in this happy time playing in this orchestra. And this thing, I mean, it's classic Borjak. It was where he was going in general. It's this gently lilting, long-lined melody, which could be Czech folk, but of course it's, it's not, it's his own. Um, but the thing about this melody is that on the one hand, it's serene, even though it's an F minor, but there is just this underlying wistfulness and sadness to it. And it's the same thing over and over again. The, the second theme is based on the first theme. The central section is contrasting, but it's short. And as a result, this thing, this initial melody just keeps going over and over in your head. And it's kind of imbued with the sadness. And I don't think it's just because you know what was going on in Borjak's life there. I think there is something below the surface as well. And I cannot get this thing out of my head <laughs> for the past two months. It just... And then, and then some orchestra goes and asks me for it again. And I'm like, no! <laughs> Lucky <laughs> you. <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> there were... I, there are two um, pieces I, I could think of that I'm mean, sort of like like you in a way they they were they're thrust upon me without me really wanting them. Um, 
one of them is a, a violin study by Wieniewski, I think. Is, uh, does that sound familiar? Um, when I was at college, I lived for, uh, briefly with a, with a violinist who was at the Guildhall. Uh, it was a not very old friend of mine. And at 8.30 every single morning, which when you're a student, 8.30 in the morning is not necessarily your best time. I would hear coming from the, from the study, this, um, the, the opening phrase of this uh, violin study, and it was quite high up. And, oh God, it was every morning for weeks. Because of course it's a study. So of course you have to do them over and over and over again, don't you? And it would just drive me mad, not just because of the melody itself, but, but also because of the time of day and the fact that it would wake me up, you know? Um, but there we, you know, we off we'd go um, out of the flat and on, on our way to college with this blimmin' thing going on in my, in my head. It wasn't really the start of the day that I'd, that I'd planned. And the other one was actually one I think I mentioned briefly uh, a few podcasts ago. And that was every Thursday night when I, when I was at school for a couple of years or so, I would stay with my grandmother who lived in, in Maidstone where I went to school, but because we actually lived about 10 miles out because um, my mum worked at a, at a market on Friday mornings, very, very early. So she couldn't take me in school. So I used to stay with her mum, my grandmother, and she was a huge Nikolai Geda fan. And for whatever reason, every Thursday night, she would tune in on the radio to Swedish radio. And the musical call that Swedish radio was starting was a melody, single line melody played on a vibraphone. And it's a it's very pleasant little tune, but, it, but they played it always twice um, at the beginning and at the end of each broadcast. And um, I would go to bed with that thing in my lodged in my head, just going round and round and round and round. And I couldn't stop it. And then I'd go to school in the morning with it going round and round and round in my, in my head. And, and I could sing it note for note now. I mean, this was 35 years ago, at least. Um, and still I can remember every single little thing about it because sometimes it's those tunes, you know, you're not expecting them and they come up behind you and then they spring on you and you can't get rid of them. Um, there's one I, one I wanted to say that there is one that I loved and I've loved for m as long as I can remember. Absolutely an earworm and also drives people completely insane if they're around you. Um, and that's Knee Play 3 from Philip Glass's Einstein on the Beach, which is a a cappella chorus uh, piece um, in this wonderful, glorious opera, Einstein on the Beach, um, which is based around numbers because the, the whole things are based around numbers. And the chorus sings one to three four, 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 very very fast. Um, in and and they're ba they're basically singing the time signature. So it might be one two three, one two three, one two three, one two three, one two three four five six seven, one two three four five six seven, one two three. It's incredibly hard to do, by the way. Uh, so any chorus that does it, uh, huge ad admiration towards them. But that to me, when I listen to that, because I really love that, and I have it on my uh, on Spotify on my uh, phone. So you know, if I was going into London or whatever, and I, I just have it on, on um, shuffle and it comes up. If, the, if I hear that, that's it. The rest of the day, I'm wandering around going, one, three, four, 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 one. It is, I think it's a fabulous little piece uh, of music actually. But again, a bit like the Gavin Bryars, I suppose, in, in a minimalist way, other people find it utterly infuriating and excruciating. <laughs> so fair enough. Tell you the one that um, the, the symphonist who I really don't mind getting lodged in the brain and um, Brahms. Um, you don't tend to associate with Brahms with earworms, but with his symphonies and some of his themes, he really absolutely knocked it out of the park. So the, the her heroic theme um, in the first symphony. And this was actually the first piece of real music that both of my kids learned to play on the piano. And it was a real moment. <laughs> so you, and and it was then it was great to get in the car and put the CD on and, you know, the horn call would come and then you'd go da, 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 da. And I like, two glowing faces in the back of the car. Whoa, we played that. <laughs> and of course, it's perfect for beginners because this theme is only, you know, two bars of a beginner piano book anyway. I'm um, two lines rather. And then also the pastoral flowing, flowing theme um, in the first movement of the second symphony. Da, 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 absolutely glorious. And then the third symphony, that lilting slow movement, my gosh, that one gets under my skin and mm. lodges. And I don't mind. I really don't mind. Mm -hmm. and, and then interestingly, the fourth movement, that first theme, I mean, there's an extent to which it's not a classic earworm in that it's disjointed, this da, da, 
da, da. and the fact that it's got this rhythmic play between two and three happening and Brahms is sort of metrical ambiguity but for some reason that one lodges as well in, in a very pleasant way I don't mind that one being there either. R Richard just get Richard off the back of what Charlotte was talking about when yeah. when she listens to a lot of recordings of the same piece I mean you you do this a similar thing every now and yeah. then and that I mean, it sort of comes back to what, what I was saying at the beginning about my work with the film stuff, where you just have to do it over and over and over again. It can that that can be really, really hard work, can't it? After, after you've done all it's, of that to shift it again. It's a funny thing. I mean, when I sort of realised I was working regularly in classical music, this was happening. I was hearing stuff a lot. I actually uh, this sounds pretentious. I sort of took a kind of. Um, sort of vow of abstinence of certain well-known repertoire pieces. I thought, you know, probably once a year, I'm going to get to hear a live performance of Beethoven Symphony X, you know, um, Brahms, whatever. Uh, I want that to be, I want to enjoy that. I want to get the most out of that. So I won't just keep listening to it over and over again at home unless someone asks me to. So a lot of standard repertoire pieces, I don't, I never really had in my record collection. I never put on, I would never go home and put on a Beethoven or a Brahms symphony because I could know, look, I'm lucky enough to be in a line of work, but quite likely I'm going to hear one of those things live sometime soon and I want to be sort of open to that experience and also I don't want it to kind of wear a groove in my memory you know how music does that it becomes yes. th there comes a point you listen to things too often the same pieces too often and certainly the same recordings too often um, that just becomes large that's all you hear you have to break yourself out of that I um, Charlotte and I wrote an article a while ago for Gramophone about Vorjak's cello concerto in the Rostropovich recording mm -hmm. which we both adore the Karyan which recording and I sat down for the first time in my life I've been listening to this recording and loving it since I was about um, 13 years old I sat down with the score for the first time and I suddenly saw that he was doing it all wrong. you know dynamics were all wrong things are being pulled around that should have been pulled around things are there that weren't there and that came as an absolute surprise to me because um, I for me that was the water groove in my mind that was how I always heard that concerto and I was always trying to fit every other performance I heard subconsciously into that groove that they worn. Um, so yeah, there is there is that question of, of not allowing things to become over familiar. I, th I think it's, as with any sort of pleasure in life, if you overdo it, do it over and over and over again, repetitively, it, it becomes routine and it should never be routine. Uh, music should certainly never be routine. I mean, I was going to say that um, there's a positive quality to all these earworms. I, I, I do have pieces I use as kind of um, mood shifting substances you know of, of automatic upper pills but, you know I can shake them out of the jar stick this in my ear and automatically I'm able to move my shift shift my mood into a slightly better place um, or I might be able to push something else out of there if I don't want to be there and mm -hmm. some pieces I can always put on and which will always sort of give me that um, chase everything else away and momentarily give me that that sort of slightly alcoholic lift um, things, and I say pretty much anything by Leroy Henderson I mean the last, oh, yes. piece, I the last piece I listened to before this podcast was the um, Penny Whistle song and for some reason that is the number one earworm but they're all earworms they're all fab uh, for yeah. me that's the one that's lodged at the moment um there's things like um anything by eric pretty much anything eric coates better pieces you know his sort of this is not sophisticated it is sophisticated music on level it's not music that aims um to achieve great artistic goals but it's just there about delivering melodies superbly and, and craft in a craftsman like way and i mean the one that i really like since i was a kid if i put this on I'm in a better mood and it's there for a while. It lodges and it stays and it sticks with me. The Chabrier is a Spaniard because that yeah. piece is just, the tunes are so absolutely infectious. They, they have that swinging waltz rhythm as well as that kind of Spanish kind of snap to them, um, that lilt. Um, and the orchestration is so sunny. I mean, we've got that fantastic French 19th century thing with the cornets that give that slightly trashy, slightly holiday sort of feel to the piece. You're, you know, yeah. so you're, you're, you're having a good time now. You know you're having a good time. This doesn't sound, you know, this isn't trying to be great serious music this is music that's out to give you pleasure and it, it does that and it's such an infectiously uh sunny in, enjoyable uh, and entertaining way but it, you know that, that 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 can chase away a lot of horrible things you've reminded me of another one that all of a sudden which is ducas sorcerer's apprentice mm -hmm. but but not not the famous tune it's just the, the uh, it's absolutely an earworm guy i know this because i do wander around the house and I, I'm singing this all the time, which is the trumpet bit just before it comes back right near the end, which is where the trumpet just goes. 
I'll sing that forever to the annoyance of everyone. Uh, so yeah, this is what I love about this program is that you, one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and you suddenly you realize you're remembering so many other pieces. So many of your suggestions, guys, have, have led to me having earworms. There's no question about that. I mean, Wagner is a perfect example. The uh, Siegfried's Funeral March, the trumpet line that we were talking about in that podcast. I mean, I had I, I obsessed over that for a, for a couple of weeks after we talked about it. I was just going to say all of that, the, the idea of picking picking a piece off the shelf in order to give you a mood. Um, my one of those is actually an earworm. You've just reminded me. It's Ravel Sagan. When I need a caffeine yeah. hit, when I'm just feeling a bit sluggish at my desk, I get high fits on playing Sagan and all <laughs> is well again. And I'm writing at mega speed. Very and good. Patrick Cabanova, that's the other one. And again, that one just goes whoosh for me every single time and, and lodges in my head that again in a, in a really nice way, which is funny when that is just a miserable opera story and me going back to Borjak, <laughs> F minor, major romance, that minor romance, I can't deal with that, but somehow it's all right being reminded of the Catcher Cabana, but go figure. Well, one of the things that gave me great pleasure on... Um, on Facebook was I, I mentioned the fact that I uh, one of mine was Gavin Bryars Jesus Blood Never Failed Me Yet, and someone said that uh, merely by mentioning it, she already had it in her head as an earworm because <laughs> it's forgotten it was there, and then suddenly I mentioned it, and there it is, bam, straight in the head. So uh, a, a good example of an earworm. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte and Richard, for that. I think we've we've gone through quite a lot of earworms, and perhaps we have uh, given. Uh, our listeners some earworms uh, again just by mentioning them um, I will of course put uh, the best of them up on our Spotify playlist to uh, annoy you and give you pleasure with a bit of luck perhaps in equal measure this time round <laughs> let's see how many of them uh, get lodged in your brain if you enjoy the classical top five please do consider making a donation uh, details are always in the summaries of each of our podcasts and if you want to follow us on Twitter we're at Classical Top 5. On Facebook, we have a page, The Classical Top 5. Just search for that. And if you'd like to email us, because we always like to hear from you, please do. Classical Top 5 at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.